Good afternoon. It's Monday the 1st of April 2019, just after one o'clock, so there'll be no April Fool's jokes here. Patrick, uh, welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me today in the studio, once again, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the programme. Great to be with you, Mike. Um, well, we'll be talking about a bit, bit of Brexit later on, but just to sort of uh, introduce it, uh, just uh, wanted to say well done to Ned uh, Pafilon, who, who was uh, uh, holding a Brexit party on Friday afternoon, managed to get it covered by the BBC. Uh, so that's uh, a bit of good news. Now, this was a small provincial uh, party, uh, but of course there was a bigger one going on and that was in uh, London. Uh, and this is Simon Bean, MBE, on uh, Friday uh, talking about uh, Defence Union. Um, and he was speaking uh, on the platform just outside the Ministry of Defence. Uh, apparently quite a number of Ministry of Defence staff listening out the open windows uh, to this. Uh, and one of the questions that he asked, which was a perfectly reasonable question, was, is it the case that the UK will hand over command and control of uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth, the UK aircraft carrier, uh, to the EU at some point in the not too distant future? Um, well, there are Ministry of Defence connections to UK Defence Journal, so they thought that it would probably be a good idea to publish this article today. Uh, the headline is uh, New EU Fleet Announced British Warships to Take Part. Uh, and, uh, well, they're making the claim that, indeed, the aircraft carrier is going to be handed over to the EU, to EU command and control. Um, there's a whole bunch of information in this article. British vessels being transferred to temporary EU command for the next six weeks. The reason for this, according to the government, is to enable better interoperability with allies. Uh, well, at the bottom of this article, then, they put the following caveat. If you've read this far, uh, you will undoubtedly have noticed the entire story as a fabrication and together uh, put together by contributors from various parts of the UK defence community and is simply an April Fool's joke. Um, so they were uh, very interested to uh, be pushing this around uh, and see what kind of response they got on Twitter and so on. The purpose of this article, they say, aside from our usual April Fool's Day joke, is to highlight that reading between the headlines should be the done thing for every article and not those just published today. Uh, the real message behind the article is be careful when you read news online or offline, as sometimes it's entirely false. Uh, well, this was then followed up with uh, Plymouth Live. Uh, this is the Plymouth Herald, and they were uh, republishing some information that appeared in The Sun, future of Royal Navy three billion pound aircraft carrier. HMS Queen Elizabeth under threat. Now, the unfortunate thing is it's very difficult to know whether this is an April Fool's joke or not, Patrick, because they don't provide any kind of caveat at the end. Uh, but they're saying that government insiders are concerned about the nation's overall defence bill, according to an exclusive report. Uh, rumours are circulating the Treasury wants the Royal Navy to ditch its new £3.1 billion aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. Government insiders are, uh, insiders are concerned about the nation's overall defence bill. Uh, and uh, that uh, questions were reportedly re raised in a key budget meeting uh, about the cost of running both Queen Elizabeth and fellow carrier Prince of Wales worth a total of £6.2 billion pounds, and whether the former is financially viable. But the concerns have reportedly enraged Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson, uh, who has insisted the Sol Solent behemoth is going nowhere. So this was all based on a Sun article. Uh, they say that a defence source said bean counters don't understand that in a crisis you must have two active in the fleet for maintenance and training. Uh, it's not clear whether that was a sideways reference to Simon Bean, who had made the comment on the, uh, uh, on the stage uh, on Friday afternoon. But look, the question then is, what is the truth of all this? That we've got at least one article uh, making fun of any such suggestion. We've got not another article that's a bit unclear whether it's true or not. It's prob probably another April Fool's joke, certainly published this morning. Uh, but this article is certainly not an April Fool's joke because this was published on the 11th of March 2019. Uh, Angela Merkel backs plans for an EU aircraft carrier. Uh, this is uh, Angela Merkel and her soon-to-be successor, uh, Ms. Cramp uh, Karen Barr, uh, who... Uh, are saying exactly that. The EU needs an aircraft carrier. They're not really sure where it's going to come from. The EU is working on its own aircraft, but it doesn't have uh, plans for, you know, to, for an actual physical car carrier at this point. So that's certainly not going to appear on the scene uh, very, very quickly. Uh, but they do need one. And so uh, uh, Merkel said it is right and good that we have such equipment on the European side. 
uh, and she's happy to work on it. Uh, but uh, the question is, where is it going to come from? Certainly, uh, the UK aircraft carrier seems like the likely initial source for that. Um, it's heading off to uh, the South China Sea in the not too distant future. Uh, and so uh, China seems to have responded to this type of, well, it's a bit of nonsense, really. But uh, this uh, article from the National Interest, Naval Power, China's Navy, Navy could have four aircraft carriers and soon. And really, this uh, uh, article making the point quite strongly that uh, China is doing exactly what Russia has done and it's gone into a massive modernization program uh, with respect to its military uh, and uh, it is uh, likely to be producing four of these type 004 uh, class carriers. They're going to displace between 90,000 and 100,000 tons. They're going to have electromagnetically assisted launch systems of course, these were the systems that were uh, dropped for the, Queen, for the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince of Wales. Um, and they're going to carry a large wing of J-15 fighters, J-31 stealth fighters, KJ-600 airborne early warning and control aircraft, anti-submarine warfare helicopters and stealth attack drones. So uh, that's what China does. Our, the Queen Elizabeth, on the other hand, isn't uh, quite so well equipped. Uh, so the Queen Elizabeth, as we said, heading off to the South China Sea, in 2021 but the question is what aircraft is it going to carry when it goes there um, because the f-35 remains absolutely unprepared uh, in many many areas uh, and uh, well how do we know that because uh, pogo uh, publishes articles from time to time reports on how far the f-35 uh, is uh, is progressing and now this is a, a US-based website that uh, provides oversight on, uh, on various government uh, uh, programs, F-35, a key one. It is well respected. Uh, they're saying that uh, aside from anything else, it is absolutely open to cyber attack, uh, to malware, because for the first time we've got a, a, a weapon system which is fully integrated. Uh, and so you can attack uh, one part of it and get access to every other part of it. Uh, but uh, the key things they're highlighting here is that, that, that in the latest uh, Department of Transport uh, report on this in the United States, uh, that in fact this new report from the US on, on uh, progress in 2018 on the F-35 um, is pretty lightweight. Uh, so they're saying that, fighter, that the F-35 still can't get into the fight. It's not fully mission capable still. Uh, they're saying that uh, its combat performance is still shrouded in mystery. Uh, it's saying that it still can't shoot straight, so apparently it shoots uh, up and to the right. Um, so it doesn't, it can't hit a target with its gun. Uh, the uh, airframe showing cracks before it's supposed to. So the thing is literally falling apart uh, before it uh, reaches its 5,000 hour, sorry, uh, 8,000 hour lifespan. Um, they're saying that the logistics and maintenance system is uh, not fit for purpose. Uh, and it's saying that the report, the final report from the Department of Transport, uh, missing key data uh, and uh, to assess progress. So 14 pages, much smaller than previous years. The 2017 report was 29 pages. The 2016 report was 61 pages. Uh, so it seems that as progress, as we move forward uh, towards the uh, F-35, uh, getting sort of operational uh, uh, into operations, uh, the information that becomes available publicly about its, uh, its capability to be in operations uh, gets shorter and shorter as they just don't bother, including information that they clearly find embarrassing. So this aircraft's still not flying as it should. Uh, and uh, well, where will Britain's aircraft carrier be in five years time? Uh, will it be part of uh, under, falling under EU command and control? We suggest that uh, that is quite a likely scenario. Uh, and really, the only answer that the uh, the mainstream media or the defence industry has is to make fun of the suggestion. They're certainly not de denying it outright. I, I think one more comment I'll make over the regards to China's uh, aircraft carrier fleet, you have to look at that development, Mike, in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and you look at sort of the deep water ports that China is involved in developing, like Sri Lanka and Djibouti, and others uh, along the sort of new trade route that uh, it will be within China's 
absolute national security interest to secure uh, and protect those trade routes, which are ma mainly we're talking about from Europe, the Red Sea, uh, down South Asia, and then to China. Mm. Uh, so you can look at that sort of development militarily as maybe China's also looking far forward in the future uh, in terms of securing uh, what it's developed and invested in in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. Absolutely. Uh, now, Patrick, let's uh, move across to Ukraine. Well, I said we weren't going to do any uh, April Fool's stories today, but you just couldn't resist this one, Mike. It's the Ukraine elections uh, over the weekend, at least the first round, as it were, and uh, kind of an April Fool's surprise, uh, and we'll tell you why. If you follow this uh, in the news, it's absolutely unique. This is the stuff of television, literally. So let's take a look at the Ukrainian elections. These were the candidates. Volodymyr Zelensky, he is a comedian and a television actor, star of the number one television show, uh, one of the number one television shows in the Ukraine. The incumbent, Petro Poroshenko, uh, he was essentially this the U.S. installed puppet uh, who has been president since 2014. And another oligarch, along with Poroshenko, Yulia Tomshenko. Uh, so she is the sort of the gas natural gas oligarch Poroshenko, the chocolate king, and you have the comedian. And let's look at the results. 30% for Zelensky, 18% for Poroshenko, and then pulling up the rear, 13% for Tomashenko. She's contesting this result, by the way. Mm -hmm. She claims that she got second place. Uh, she's doing her own recount. She's hiring her own firm to do an independent recount. So this is uh, out of a total of, Mike, of something like 30 candidates. 30 candidates stood in this presidential election. These were the top three. We knew that this would be uh, the top three, uh, but we really didn't know, and no one really knew exactly what sort of landslide uh, would take place with Zelensky. This is a total surprise. This is uh, a comedian. This is an actor. And what's more interesting, we'll, we'll look at his background a little bit, but um, this is the New York Times, no joke, Ukrainian TV comedian wins elections first rounds. Now, New York Times prefaced this, Mike, with a little bit of propaganda here. Uh, the fact that the Ukraine works as a real democracy, albeit a troubled one, is often cited as perhaps the most important aspect of the election, unlike the, <laughs> unlike the Potemkin elections in neighboring Russia and Belarus. The contest in Ukraine offers voters a real choice with the outcome unknown. And so they're basically saying, getting a dig in there. This is a news article, by the way basically calling uh, Russia um, uh, a tin pot dictatorship. Yeah, a yeah. non-democratic country <laughs> next door, which is funny. I mean, let's not get too much into this, but Putin's approval rating is, is sort of around 70%. Mm. So uh, not the same thing in the Ukraine. So here is the front runner right now. Now, uh, there will be a second round because he didn't get the 50% uh, which is required for an outright victory in the first round. So there's going to be a runoff. And it looks like it's going to be Poroshenko and Zelensky. And uh, so his t television show, Servant of the People, believe it or not, Mike, believe it or not, the theme of this television show is a school teacher who suddenly found himself president of the Ukraine, battling corruption. This is what we're looking at here. Servant of the People is the show. And here he is, this is what he had to say. You may think, this is talking to the voters, you may think you're somewhere out there on the internet. And we are somewhere far away, but we are all one life together. So very better O'Rourke in his uh, rhetoric here. Uh, this is the comedian. So let's look at the incumbent. And he is absolutely coming out swinging, Mike. Uh, he just is beside himself. This is... Petro Poroshenko, the Russian chocolate king. And he's saying Putin wants a weak president, so he's, he's, he's seated this conspiracy theory uh, in certain uh, sides of the Ukrainian media that uh, this is a Russian-backed comedian, basically. These are some of the, the rumors we're seeing online. Here's what Poroshenko has to say. He's talking about his, his competitor here. He dreams of a soft, submissive, submissive gentle, uh, giggling, inexperienced, weak, ideologically amorphous, and politically uncertain president. Will we gift him this? So he's, again, this is directed at some Putin plot, basically. 
uh, and he continues here, getting a little bit more serious, from this very minute, we need the total mobilization of all Ukrainian patriots. That, my friends, Mike, is a dog whistle to guess who. Mm. So he's talking about the street fascists, the neo-Nazis, those are his shock troops. So no one, says Poroshenko, has the right to leave the country's fate up to those who are casting their votes, as they say, as a joke. The jokes are over, says Poroshenko. And I think this is probably the most telling uh, statement he made over the weekend, which is right here. Uh, on April 21st, this is the second round, we will either confirm our movement towards the EU and NATO, or we'll turn back. I would like to remind everyone that this is not a joke. That's his campaign basically into round two, Mike. So what do you think of that? I think uh, on that second slide there, you were, his quote was suggesting that uh, uh, really democracy should not be part of, uh, of, of the process here. We can't leave it to democracy to, to get the right answer. We've got to what, bring in the, uh, the shock troops to sort the problem out? Is that, is that what he's arguing for? Oh, Pam calling on all patriots to mobilize all patriots. So th look, look at this. This is total voter apathy, Mike. Mm. Total disenchantment of the political system in the Ukraine, okay? It doesn't get any more obvious than this. Some of the supporters of Zelensky said that they believe that Zelensky, the comedian, is not contaminated by politics. Mm. So this is a kind of continuation of the Trump phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, in the Ukraine, but I think on a much even more higher level. This would be like Martin Sheen, star of the West Wing, or Kevin Spacey, star of House of Cards, uh, runs for president and wins by a landslide. I mean, this is beyond Trump, basically. Uh, and so also there's the issue of the Donbass. Zelensky's platform, Mike, was I'm going to end the war in eastern Ukraine in the Donbass and everyone's going to get free bread. Mm. Basically, um, I think the the free bread part was a bit of tongue in cheek, uh, but uh, so let's 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 look at this for a minute. Total disenchantment, Mike, and you have to remember. Let's look at uh, the situation with the revolution. It wasn't long, Mike, before we had longer. We had the Maidan revolution. This was the glorious revolution where the United States, the EU, backed uh, a, basically a coup in Kiev and forcibly overthrew. Uh, the democratically elected President Viktor Yanukovych, uh, and we got Yatsin Yuk in the interim, and then Petro Poroshenko six months later. And this is basically what's happened, Mike, since, since the revolution. We have 13,000 dead, millions displaced, corruptions at an all-time high, oligarchs still run the country, resurgence in fascism, armed neo-Nazi factions are commonplace and actually been integrated uh, into the Ukraine's armed forces in some cases, poor relations with Russia, that's a given, xenophobia and racism at an all-time high, debt levels at an all-time high, $5.6 billion bailout recently for a private bank, loss in consumer purchasing power, they have inflation issues still, uh, loss of the Crimea, uh, quite a large chunk of the country, and it looks like, like there's going to be, eventually it's going to be a loss of eastern Ukraine the Donbass territory. So is it any wonder, Mike, that voter disenchantment is at an all-time high? Is it any surprise that they have basically chosen a comedian, a television star, who played the president on TV as their new leader over the US-backed, the EU-backed, the NATO-backed Poroshenko? Is that gonna happen in Britain? It could happen at, at, these days. It probably can happen any anywhere. Yeah. But this seems to have, seems to be a surprise. But let me hold with with withhold my judgment on this, mm -hmm. because uh, Zelensky has some very interesting connections. We could go into those uh, later, especially after he wins, if mm -hmm. he wins the next round of elections. Um, they'll be interesting to see. This will be a tight contest, I predict. Pe Petro Poroshenko has control of the military, effectively has control of the shock troops. Uh, so there, this was a 30%, 18% spread here. With Tomashenko out, Mike, um, Petro Poroshenko probably get some of those oligarch-type votes in there. It's going to be a very tight contest mm -hmm. coming up on April 21st. Okay. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's move to international affairs. And, well, here is an article from the Washington Post, uh, Patrick. Britain has been shaping the world for centuries. That won't change with Brexit. Now, who could have written this? 
Well, it is none other than our illustrious Foreign Secretary himself, Jeremy Hunt. Uh, and uh, so he said that we have to put aside the doom-laden commentary and accept his assurance. We British are neither abandoning our neighbours nor retreating from the world. Uh, we have not taken leave of our sex senses. Look beneath the surface uh, and Britain's international position remains unchanged. The United Kingdom is a small archipelago with rather less than 1% of the world's population. Alongside the United States, we have done more to shape the world uh, we live in than any other country and remain the, in the global top five of most important leagues. So Britain is leaving the structures of the EU, which we joined as recently 19, as 1973, as that organization moves from economic cooperation to political union. Now, I'm not aware that uh, that statement has been made by a government minister in this country uh, to the British press, but that's what he's writing in the United States. Uh, and uh, he said, but our, our unconditional commitment to the security of our continent long predates our EU membership and will not waver after we leave. Now, to get more on what the implications of that are, uh, you need to have a look at last Friday's uh, UK column news when we go into the details of what exactly uh, government ministers mean when they use the word security with respect to the EU. But it's an all-encompassing phrase. Uh, and uh, he that, could, that could mean, sorry, military unification. It absolutely means that. Military unification. It absolutely means that, yes. Right. Yes, and, and he went on to say Britain has been shaping the world for centuries and we are here to stay. So Britain has been shaping the world for centuries and we are here to stay. So keep that in mind because uh, also over the weekend or just before the weekend, Larry Johnson from Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, that's VIPS, former CIA, uh, was uh, writing in... Uh, uh, the uh, Pat Lang's blog, uh, Sick Semper Tyrannus, uh, and he had this to say, uh, the conspiracy against Donald Trump, in my opinion, originated with British intelligence uh, and persons connected with the Clinton campaign. Now, this is a point that we've made, uh, and you've made specifically plenty of times, uh, but he says the, con uh, the provocation dangle of George Papadopoulos was the result of electronic inter intercepts by Brit British intelligence, uh, GCHQ, um, targeting people working on the Trump campaign. The collection effort generated hundreds of highly classified SIGINT messages that were disseminated in the US intelligence community. Uh, those messages led to the unmasking of more than 100 Americans whose names appeared in those reports. And this intel dump from the Brits became the, uh, the predicate for launching a counterintelligence investigation of Donald Trump and his campaign. Uh, when the tale of the plot to destroy Donald Trump's candidacy and presidency is told, uh, Jim Clapper will be proven as a key player in the conspiracy. Clapper was not a passive observer. I'm told by friends who had direct dealings with Clapper during the, his tenure as a director of national intelligence that he was helping coordinate the activities of the CIA, the NSA and the FBI in the collection and dissemination of information on Trump and his associates. So uh, he, uh, he calls Clapper a congenital liar uh, and, and so on. So... Uh, it's interesting that, that, uh, that uh, Jeremy Hunt uh, suggesting that uh, the UK uh, has always been a major manipulator in world affairs, that that's going to continue. And uh, in parallel with that, we've got uh, a former uh, US intelligence analyst uh, absolutely saying that, that uh, the Russiagate campaign was a British intelligence operation from the start. And I might add to what Larry Johnson said there in terms of the stitch up of George Papadopoulos that was used to trigger the investigation is a comment I made uh, on a Twitter thread uh, with Glenn Greenwald uh, just a few days just a few days ago, and uh, Larry has just uh, backed up what I said basically. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to add to that that it was uh, Joseph uh, Mifsud and also Alexander Downer, the Australian diplomat, with very tight connections. Uh, with the Australian intelligence services uh, that were involved in sort of passing uh, Papadopoulos back and forth between them. Uh, and so they were playing a bit of tag team, uh, those two, mm. uh, with Papadopoulos. And so that led to this becoming uh, the alarm going off in the FBI that uh, someone was interested, or the Russians were interested in Hillary's emails, for instance, or that Papadopoulos was interested in uh, information about what the Russians had on Hillary's private server, mm. emails and so forth. It was all fabricated, mm. basically, and it was a, it was a frame up, uh, which they used 
uh, to sort of get this whole thing going. And the worst part about it, Mike, uh, was that it was used also to drag Papadopoulos into uh, the whole Mueller circus. Mm. And he was actually uh, sentenced or indicted and sentenced, did a couple of weeks uh, inside. But uh, I think he'll be vindicated by the end of it. His book is out now and it's doing very well. And um, he'll also be very public in the next month or so because they're going to, if they declassify the FISA warrants uh, in the United States, it's a very important part of the story, the, the whole FISA process, foreign intelligence, uh, getting the warrants for wiretapping American, Trump, Trump associates, American citizens, uh, which is how they nabbed uh, Michael Flynn as well mm. uh, in a perjury trap. Uh, with this. So this is, this is all very, very interesting. And it does make sense uh, once you get into the facts. So now the facts are coming out after two years. Uh, what you've seen in the media, uh, what you've been reading in The Guardian has been fake news for the last two years with regards to Trump, Russia collusion. Now the truth's coming out. We'll, well see what happens. Yes. Well, speaking of fake news, uh, Patrick, what has uh, EU versus disinfo been up to? Well, this is a, a great uh, feature, which is up on 21st Century Wire right now. This is by Nina Cross. Uh, this kind of outlines, Mike, this massive operation that has been erected uh, in the wake of the Russia Gate uh, hoax uh, that was perpetrated beginning from the 2016 election. So this is where it all started with the, uh, the Trump-Russia collusion conspiracy theory. And on the, on the basis of this, this idea that the Russians are meddling in our elections, that uh, our elections are under attack by Vladimir Putin, etc., all of that sort of that fabricated hoax, um, this has been used uh, to sort of trigger a whole new industry, which is the disinformation industry. And it's a total gravy train. In Europe alone, there's a number of these initiatives and projects. We've covered quite a few of them uh, on this show. And uh, the Integrity Initiative, of course, uh, files are up on the ukcolumn.org. Uh, but this is a great, great piece because it, it kind of gets into the psychology, Mike, of uh, you know, how they sort of construct all of these so-called hybrid threats. And what are they really but paper tigers? And so Russian influence, this is the main the main thing that all of these organizations uh, out of Brussels uh, are meant to sort of be fighting against is Russian influence. And this basically boils down to what, Mike? It boils down to sort of any ideas that run counter to whatever the mainstream narrative is, whatever the rapid response mechanism uh, party line is mm -hmm. uh, amongst NATO countries. That's all considered to be Russian influence. Anybody that has anything that agrees with a headline on RT is, is under Russian influence. Any Russian media outlet is automatically deemed to be propaganda or disinformation. And if you agree with that, you yourself are somehow under the spell of this uh, grand Russian plot. What is this really, Mike, but the Maginot line of information? And uh, it, so you know, Europe does have form, Mike. This is the point. Europe has got pedigree and form when it comes to building Maginot lines. And, it, and, and Nina Cross is arguing that... Uh, we have a sort of a Maginot line being built here in the sort of this disinformation uh, firewall, protection firewall that they're trying to erect here uh, in Europe. It is nothing but a Maginot line, uh, which wasn't very effective, Mike, no. in the Second World War. How much did it cost? Oh, I wasn't going to do the calculation. What was the cost of the Maginot line in today's money? Mm. I think it would have been a lot, actually, in terms of like what France had you know, for defense at the mm. time, but a big percentage of their budget. And what did the Germans do? They just went, went, around, it. went around it. So. Yeah, well, sticking with the subject of fake news, uh, Veto, The Veto, uh, this is a documentary film, Patrick, uh, which is highlighting some of the fake news which mainstream media, Western mainstream media, British, United States, other European mainstream media, have been perpetrating on the people of uh, Syria. Sure, yeah, this is up on 21st Century Wire. Right now, uh, if you listen to the Sunday Wire last night, we had an interview with Vanessa Bealey, uh, who's a big part of this film. She provided all the commentary uh, for all of these exposures. Uh, basically, what does this film show? This is a tremendous film, Mike. The Veto. You can go watch this for free right now at 21stCenturyWire.com. Take this link, everybody, and share it with everybody you know on Facebook, on Twitter, on whatever social media platforms that you're on. You have to see this. Basically, this film, this is the first time anybody has caught 
red-handed, CNN, fabricating news reports in Syria. The same for Al Jazeera, and also some very shady reporting from uh, Channel 4 News, basically. And of course, you can't talk about fakery in Syria without talking about the UK, US, and EU-funded white helmets, aka the Syrian Civil Defense. They're also exposed uh, in this feature-length documentary film. This is a Syrian production, uh, so this is made in Syria. It's excellent production. Uh, this has already been shown via satellite on a number of channels uh, globally. Uh, but now it's available online, so you can watch the veto featuring Vanessa Bealey, who's been on this show many times. So Vanessa's done the English uh, narr narration on this, but there are many other languages available as well. It's available in French, uh, Russian, uh, I'm not sure, uh, Spanish, I would imagine, uh, English, of course, Arabic. Uh, but uh, Vanessa was also involved in the investigation yes. as well. So it's, a, it's an amazing amazing documentary that will change the way you look at these media outlets, mainstream media outlets. Mike, are any of these mainstream me media outlets going to be censured or punished or any of these reporters or editors reprimanded for producing, being caught producing fabricated news reports in Syria? Will, will this happen? No. This is my question. The answer is no. No, no. So I guess it's just bloggers are the problem, right? Yeah, absolutely. Bloggers are the problem. Okay, let's come back to the UK, and it's two years since Project Servitor uh, went live. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what that is, this is the, uh, the uh, well, it's a vital policing and counterterrorism tactic of the Ministry of Defence Police. This is basically the fusion doctrine in action. Now, we've been talking about the fusion doctrine for quite some time. Theresa May uh, announced this term uh, in a recent uh, defence review. Uh, and it's, it involves the merging of the oper the operational merging of various government departments across an across government approach, and this particular expression of it, Project Servitor, uh, is about uh, the Ministry of Defence Police working with the City of London Police, with the Metropolitan Police, uh, and every other the British Transport Police, and so on. They're effectively operating as one unit. Uh, so this is two years since the Ministry of Defence Police launched Project Servitor at HM Naval Base Portsmouth and, atop, at, and at the Atomic Weapons Establishment sites in Berkshire. Uh, but they're now uh, looking after Defence HQ in Whitehall, uh, HM Naval Base Clyde uh, and a bunch of other uh, UK locations. Um, so this apparently allows them to deliver unique specialist policing to protect the nation's defence and national infrastructure, keeping people and assets safe. Uh, but a large part of it seems to be all about uh, engaging with the public and making sure the public are providing them with the information that they uh, believe that they need. Um, but the key point here being that this is the merging of, uh, operationally at least at this point, the merging of uh, police services uh, to provide a, a service. Uh, now, if uh, people have been following David Scott's commentary from what's been going on in Scotland after the uh, Scottish police forces were merged into one police Scotland uh, and finding the problems that have arisen in the last few years as a result of that. Well, you'll understand what the potential dangers are here, uh, but what this seems to be is uh, a sort of move towards militarization of the police as well. So we've got to keep that into consideration. It's that Jean, Jean de Marie uh, European trend that we've covered many times well, that, that's on, a, on this program. And isn't that ironic, Mike, that uh, Britain's supposedly leaving the EU but becoming more European? As, as this process is meant to be taking place. Absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, you know, perhaps we don't need to worry, uh, Patrick, because, uh, you know, some time ago we mentioned the fact that uh, uh, Gavin Williamson had announced that we would develop a swarm of squadrons of network-enabled drones. So maybe they can be watching what all these police forces are doing from a great height or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, today uh, the Many Drones Make Light Work project has been announced by, the, uh, by DASA. Uh, and uh, this is new funding uh, to uh, steer this project for 20 unmanned aerial systems. Uh, this is now in its final stages of development uh, and it's going to be ultimately managed by the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. Uh, they're looking to deal with areas such as situational awareness, medical assistance, logistics, resupply, uh, explosive ordnance detection and disposal, uh, but also confusion and deception. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite sure. 
how swarms of drones will, will do that. But, sowing, but they, sowing confusion like Putin does. Well. I was thinking small drones. With Gavin, I was thinking the little ones. Yes. Imagine a swarm of the little ones flying down through your fireplace. Gary, isn't it? It is after midday. Uh, but anyway, anyway, let's let's move on to the most important topic that I, I'm sure everybody's been sitting on the edges of their seats waiting for, uh, and that is uh, Brexit. Well, what's Tommy up to is the headline in Prospect, how Tom Watson became Labour's other leader. Uh, now, what's this about? Well, Tom Watson is basically not ruling out uh, getting together with Tory party members uh, and uh, Liberal Democrat party members, SNP party members, and setting up a government of national unity. Uh, and this has been the topic of discussion over the weekend on all the various uh, discussion programs like Andrew Marr, for example, as we'll come on to in a second. Um, so uh, he's saying that uh, a mixed cabinet would be useful uh, if needs be, uh, because, you know, basically like Ernie Bevan, he says, I prefer Labour governments uh, and I hope we never get to a point where our economy or security are in peril, that we need a government of national unity, but unity, but if needs must, we uh, have then to do what's right. This view was echoed by uh, none other than uh, John Major, who said uh, one way is a general election that produces a clear majority. The other is to have some sort of unity or national government. He was talking about how uh, they were going to pursue uh, Brexit. Apologies for the, the lack of uh, uh, labelling of who that is. And the same for Nicky Morgan here, who said it may well be that if you end up with a cross-party approach, uh, to finding a majority in the House of Commons, it might be that you need a cross-party approach to implementing Brexit. So this is uh, without, uh, this is absolutely clearly now part on right front and centre of everybody's uh, uh, policy. But the question is, where does this come from? This sounds very Blairite in its, uh, in its approach. You know, we need to take a centrist approach. We need to come together mm. uh, and, and build a government of national unity. Maybe that's the only way that we're, we're going to achieve it. But the question is, what are we going to achieve? Because Julian Smith, MP, who's the Tory chief whip, uh, was coming to, commenting to the BBC and saying, uh, well, basically, as a result of not achieving a, a terribly great majority in the 27 election, that that was inevitably going to uh, lead to people having to accept a closer relationship with the EU after Brexit. In other words, ex an extremely soft Brexit. Uh, <clears throat> yes, or no Brexit. Uh, I think, as we've said for uh, three years now, that is the uh, outcome. Uh, but let's just briefly uh, let people, sorry, let people uh, know what the timetable is for this week. Tonight, uh, there's going to be votes on Oliver Letwin and Yvette Cooper's uh, amendments uh, attempting to bring the customs union into the uh, withdrawal agreement. If that's done, uh, then perhaps Theresa May will get her fourth uh, meaningful vote through. Uh, tomorrow the Cabinet are going to discuss uh, that, those votes and what the response to that. Some people expecting half the Cabinet to resign immediately. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, Oliver Letwin's going to come back and try to take control of uh, the Commons to pursue, to continue with this soft Brexit plan. Uh, and then on Thursday, there is a definite possibility that Theresa May is going to attempt to bring her vote, her uh, deal back for a fourth time, on the basis that each time it's been voted on so far, uh, the uh, the the uh, the number of votes against has been shrinking. So the first time it was a couple of hundred, the second time it was 130 or something. Last week it was 60, uh, and uh, she thinks that this is a an ongoing trend, and she's going to succeed in uh, in, in getting this passed. Um, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, she, so her argument is that the, the downward trend in support uh, for her deals actually um, uh, a signal that uh, it's it's going to succeed. That the, the, the downward uh, trend in the opposition to her deal means that it's going to succeed. So she's going to try and bring it back again. Right. So yes. Will, will Burko, will uh, the speaker, uh, intervene <clears throat> uh, with any surprises? Do you think, or is this is this going to go ahead as scheduled? I think it's going to go ahead in some way, but but we'll see. We'll see what happens with Oliver Letwin's vote later on. Uh, as I say, he wants to try to include a proper customs union. <clears throat> and of course, if a customs union was included in the withdrawal agreement, uh, then the worries about the backstop would disappear. You see, this, that, that solves that problem. But we'll see what happens next. Okay, we're going to end on this, uh, this Patrick, because, uh, well, 
What's creepy Joe been up to in the well, U.S.? Well, look, uh, Joe Biden, who uh, amongst all polls, Mike, is, is the Democratic frontrunner uh, for the 2020 elections. I know that might surprise some people, but a lot of polls are, are putting him ahead of Bernie Sanders and all the rest of the field. And here is the National Review, Mike. And the headline couldn't be any more clear. Joe Biden is done. And what is this all about? Well, it's this creepy Uncle Joe uh, has apparently, well, he, he's been caught in the Me Too scandal, Mike. Uh, Lucy Flores, uh, who was, this isn't her picture, by the way, I, I don't think, but uh, this is Ash Carter's wife, actually, that one of the many uh, females that Biden uh, is uh, extra friendly with. In, in public settings, but... Uh, and, and not just adult females either? No, not unfortunately not, not just adults, uh, correct. So Lucy Flores, 35, ran for lieutenant governor of Nevada, and Biden showed up at one of her events, and uh, this was sort of classed by her as uh, sexual abuse, uh, what he did in terms of, like, similar to kind of heavy breathing in the ear, groping, and she said it was just really disgusting and mm -hmm. couldn't... Uh, you know, it changed the way she looked at uh, him as a political figure and as a person. But anyway, there's a whole string of these sort of incidents with Biden, uh, and it looks like it sh this should kill his any chances of him uh, being a democratic, a serious democratic candidate, Mike. Well, well, will it? Because because the thing that it, that strikes me is that uh, like many of these public figures, that eventually. You know, I'm not making any allegation against Joe Biden here, but but if we look at other public fi figures that have had these types of allegations, um, it's been going on for a very long time, and and in general, the public turns a blind eye. In the case of uh, Joe Biden, th this type of behaviour has been going on for a very long time, time, and up until now, the public seem to have been taking a, turning a blind eye. It could, it, it, is he actually done? Is the public finally getting to the point of saying enough's enough? And the question is, who's the public, Mike? This is the big question. Well, the voting public, isn't it? Well, it's the voting public, but uh, have, have a look at Creepy Joe for a minute. Um, the, the, the people who've been turning a blind eye have been the Democratic uh, partisan mainstream media, that's CNN, M MSNBC, The Washington Post, The New York Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, and The LA Times, the major media outlets, CNN in the United States uh, have ignored all of Joe Biden's just abhorrent behavior over the last uh, eight years. This is right through the Obama presidency, but mm -hmm. it even goes back further than that, Mike. Okay. And all of the Democratic voters viewed Biden as a potential challenger to Donald Trump. So they all went and zipped it, basically. Oh, let's not say anything uh, because we don't want to hurt the chances that he could beat Trump. All the polls say, say he'll beat Trump, so let's use that sort of don't criticize Joe Biden. And this is where it's got them right now. Now you have a whistleblower who stepped forward uh, and she's got a story to tell, it's gone national. And the only thing we see coming out of the Democratic camp, for the most part, Mike, is apologists about, oh, this is just the way Joe Biden behaves. He's overly affectionate, overly tactile, is another word. Uh, that came up uh, in a news report. Uh, I, I mean, the thing that struck me about that is that image that they've chosen for from that video. Um, Ash Carter was in the room at the time standing, giving, giving stand, a speech, standing right next to her. Next and, to and he's and he was and if anybody has seen that video, it really is quite creepy. Yeah, and I would like to see Ash Carter or somebody come up and and sort of comment on this story mm. or some of these people or the many uh, parents of children who were on stage with Joe Biden while he was. Mm. Being overly tactile, as the as the as his supporters would say, um, you know, is someone going to speak up about it? And Barack Obama, mm. who was the president, they were together for eight years. He gave Joe Biden the Medal of Freedom. That was the last thing Obama did as president. Mm. The number one highest level award you can get in the United States. Joe Biden got it from Obama just a week before Donald Trump was inaugurated. Mm. Uh, and so, and I always, n no one could figure out what Biden actually did to actually deserve that that award. And uh, it just had an eerie similarity to uh, uh, other characters that we have uh, seen mm. following some of the same patterns. So yes. very disturbing. We'll see what happens. Okay, okay, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Patrick, for uh, your contribution today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be back at the same time, 1 p.m. as usual on Wednesday. We will see you then. Bye-bye.